All right, here we are. Good afternoon to all, and welcome to uh, seminar 13 of year two of our Maximo seminar. We are still, <clears throat> excuse me, we're still in volume two of the Ambigua. We're looking at Ambigua 31 through 36 today. It's pages 39 through 73 in, in volume two. Uh, the themes today, the themes are, are God beyond God and the one. Uh, that's, that's, that's one kind of theme. And also ecstasy and the giving, the giving or the gift. Giving and the gift is, is where we keep, we'll keep circling. But because we're talking about oneness and ecstasy and giving, we're also going to be considering uh, composition and completion composition and completion, as well as simple form, simple form and drawing near, simple form and drawing near. So oneness and ecstasy and simplicity and form and drawing near. Last, <clears throat> we ended, or, or we, 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 we discussed uh, last time, the question of, do we believe in Bach's simplicity? only because we know his sophistication? Do, do we believe in Bach's simplicity only because we know his sophistication? We didn't probe the word belief, although belief would be a wonderful word to probe here. But just to keep with the question, do we believe in Bach's simplicity only because we know his sophistication? Do we need this counterpart? Do we need the counterpart? Do we need the complement? Do we need the completion? Or, put differently, do we trust purity? Do we trust purity? Or do we need to think in terms of a measure or in terms of a referential context? That's the underlying question throughout the whole thing, perhaps. Now, in the seminar, we refer often to relation, to movement, to complement, to completion, to these sorts of words. And these are good. These are good. It's good that we do it. Integrity is central. Integrity is central and important. And relation, movement, complementarity, completion, all have to do with integrity. And yet we can ask within something integral, within an integrity, where lies our emphasis? Where lies our emphasis or our emphases? This is a traditional way of posing the question which is framed critically as the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Emphasis is the, the positive way of looking at that same conundrum. So we refer to relation, to movement, to complements. We're asking, can we trust purity? Do we trust purity or do we need the complement? And the question in part is, are words like relation and refer, these terms still observe distinction, or they do observe distinction, let's say, not still, they do observe distinction. Distinction in itself is not problematic, but insofar as we tend to see and treat distinction as division, it becomes problematic. It becomes problematic. So Heraclitus, who states more than once that he prefers the perceptible, the sensible, the aesthetic, what he can see and hear to the abstract. Heraclitus warns us prior to the period we're talking about, states rather that in distinction, we ought to see unity, not division. In distinction, we ought to see unity or oneness, oneness either manifested or presented. I'm not sure what would be the better word, but in distinction, we ought to see oneness manifested or presented. He says, just a, a smattering of, 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 of his uh, phrases, he says, all things are one, all things are one. That is, the cosmos is one. He critiques Hesiod for distinguishing day and night and not recognizing that they are one, 
they are one as in they complete each other. It's one movement day and night. Or he says, good and ill are one. Agathon ke kakon tafton. Good and ill come from are of are tautological of the same of the same source, right? And we think fair enough, looking ethically. Or he says the wise or wisdom to sophon. The wise is one alone, both willing and unwilling to be called by the name of Zeus. So the most divine is called and is beyond our calling, but is one. So what we can call and what we cannot call is one in Heraclitus' vision. Contrast Maximus's language of is and is called. This is and is called, right? But to go back to the wise is one alone, both willing and unwilling to be called by the name of Zeus. Well, as Michael has reminded us many times, one of Heraclitus' uh, most profound insight is, is nature loves to hide. Nature is one, but some is present, some is manifested, some is concealed. Or rather, not concealed, but not present in the way we expect. Heraclitus also says, the Lord whose oracle is at Delphi neither speaks nor conceals, but gives a sign, i.e. gestures towards the whole without saying this or that, without distinguishing within the whole. And then my favorite uh, of, of, of his statements that I, that I drew forward for this, the harmony past knowing sounds more deeply than the known. The harmony past knowing sounds more deeply than the known. Harmony spans what we know and what we do not know. What we do not know is one harmony as well. So we, with, these, with these questions or these, these ideas in mind, we might ask, is this a oneness of what? A unity based on what? Based on matter? We've seen this philosophical move with the Greeks before or based on our intellectual grasp, right? Is it unified in our apprehension? Are things unified in our vision of things? Does our vision and participation unify? Or are things unified, say, in, in a register of articulation? And sometimes we've distinguished the aesthetic register and the noetic register. Does the aesthetic register unify those things within it? Now, uh, these are real questions. I think that Heraclitus sees as far as one can here. He, he, he reminds us that reference to re reference binds into struggle. And relation, relation brings the fire of friction. Reference binds into struggle, or as he sometimes calls it, strife or war, polemos. And relation brings the fire of friction. Now, to, to, to step back into, into more uh, the terms we've been using with Maximus, this is all thinking of movement as temporal, thinking of movement as temporal, i.e. thinking of movement in the aesthetic register, not movement beyond time, as Maximus also characterizes, not movement of the age. And thus being temporal, time-bound, the oneness discussed so far, arguably, is a oneness which is unto death, so to speak, or of a closed ontology, as John Tzizulis says, of a closed ontology. He says the Apophatic, the, the Cappadocian fathers were responding to the closed ontology of the Greeks. This oneness is a closed ontology. That's the, that's the, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, that's the, uh, the suggestion. A oneness which is unto death. What does this mean? It means that every form includes all deformation. Everything formed by the very act of being formed includes all deformation, all that is not given form in that form. That's of its own. That's a form's own completion. A form is complete only by being both form and deformed. 
transformation, transformation needs another, needs another. So let's come at it with a slightly different angle. Let's consider the horizon, the horizon of our light, our horizon, our horizon. The boundary of our horizon, the boundary of our personal horizon, establishes the darkness that encompasses, hems in, and delimits our light, right? By our own lights, the darkness beyond the horizon of our own lights is death, right? So, in other words, death is our completion by our own lights. And this is true until Christ draws us near and unto his own great horizon, his own great horizon, which is beyond boundary and form. And we begin our healing through synergy. Right? So Christ has blessed us as we are and has become truly one with us as we are. Maximus reiterates this again and again in these readings. Christ has blessed us as we are and has become truly one with us. That's oneness. What does this mean? This means that our mortal horizons, which as we noted last time, we're revisiting ideas from last time still, our mortal horizons, which, is, which are composed of distinction and movement and time, distinction, movement, and time, that's our mortal horizon. They're gathered unto and surpassed, gathered unto and surpassed in the horizon of Christ, in which and in whom these elements movement, distinction, and time, are fulfilled beyond their measure. Right. And yet, we are here and now, in relation with others, and composite beings making and thinking compound things. And so we need to deal with relation. We need to deal with um, composition, with comportment. As our life is compound and experienced in the aesthetic register of form and relation, we don't have what we could call categorical oneness. We don't know categorical or categorical, we could even say oneness. We have the phrase one as one. We understand one as one. And that as, that linking term as, which we've seen before, is the aesthetic the aesthetic move, one as one. It's the double, the figure of the double, speaking uh, uh, in terms of a, a trope, literary trope. So we don't have categorical oneness. We have one as one, or we have one is one, and that is noetic communion. So we have the aesthetic double, one as one, or noetic communion, one is one. Right. Just hold that thought for half a second. So then, trying to follow this thought in terms of form. Our considered form, when we consider form, and consideration is like composition or comportment, it's the gathering. Considered form is the integral gathering of things for and unto relation for and unto relation. We still see distinction and possibly division in terms of considered form. When we're able to think in terms of appropriate form, then we see how things dance together. This is what we see in Maximus. We see how things dance together as doubles, not as binding references or strife, uh, stri you know, strife-filled relation but dance together as one. There's that aesthetic as, they dance together as one. But appropriate form, like we have in Maximus, like we seek in this seminar, is for the sake of simple form. Simple form, we've seen this concept in Maximus before, simple form. And simple form is a paradox because we know that simplicity compasses and knows form without observing its measure. Simplicity compasses and knows form without observing its measure. And so when we say simple form, we kind of mean form beyond form. 
form beyond form, uh, to, to use a, a kind of paradox. Simple form or form beyond form is what saves us from thinking that form will save us from bringing about or inhabiting an idolatry of form. An idolatry of form is nihilistic. It might be the most nihilistic position we have, but we have to be careful even here that we don't become nihilistic. So appropriate form, we move through considered form and appropriate form for the sake of simple form. For the sake of, in ontological terms, is our, our being unto, our stance, or our disposition. Right? For the sake of means our co-responsive ethos, our completion in Christ, right? our intimate communion, or our incarnate and felt hope for the sake of. And what's the teaching of oneness here? The teaching of oneness is we are taught, or, or God is revealed as man. Christ is revealed as person. Our existence is blessed as theosis. Our life is, excuse me, blessed as communion. This is that one as one, life as communion. Existence as theosis, God as man, Christ as person. Our ultimate for the sake of is, is, is for Christ, Christ who is, Christ as he is, our measure. And so the key here is the movement as, the aesthetic movement as, which is our mysterious way of drawing near. That word as is our way of drawing near the mystery without identification or idolatry. Okay, let's, uh, holding those in mind, let's, let's move on to Ambiguum 31. And we'll point to a number of passages here, uh, walking through a few, a few points, reading out a few things. This Ambiguum seems to me to be about the healing presence of our Lord, the healing presence of our Lord. It's from St. Gregory's Oration, on the, on, the, on the nativity, pardon me. It's page 39, Ambiguum 31. I'll just quickly read out Gregory's, uh, or the extract rather, Maximus has drawn from Gregory. Gregory says, the laws of nature are abolished. The world above must be filled. Christ commands us, let us not resist. All right, hold that language. That's curious language. Just hold that in mind. Now, the first thing that I want to know is over on page 41, 41. And it's just about seven lines up from the bottom. And here, Maximus makes it clear that our renewal is in love and restoration. Our renewal is in love and restoration. Or our life is through communion. Right? He says, divine creation was renewed so that God... <clears throat> Uh, with his strength, could restore out of his love for mankind. Right. This is our incarnate hope. We are asked to love each other. That's all. And we are blessed with renewal and restoration of, of our being in this love with which we love each other. It's the simplest, it's the simplest uh, commandment, as it were, or blessing or injunction. And then... Moving over to uh, 43, and just to, I'm not going to read out, but just in the top half of the page, Maximus uh, talks about likeness, likeness, likeness as, as, in terms of being as, right? A being as transgressive, likeness to his transgression, or a likeness to his obedience. So it's a being as transgression or a being as obedience. And he says, this means to be spiritual born, spiritually born in Christ. The world above is filled by those who are spiritually born. So to be spiritually born in Christ is to draw near in likeness to his obedience. His obedience. His, and as we say, his obedience unto death, which is his complete giving over of himself, his complete giving of himself unto others. Lord have mercy. 
And then <clears throat> we're just pointing to some 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 things here. Also on page 43, we see that that title or the uh, section uh, title, another interpretation of St. Gregory's words. And that another interpretation, if we looked up that in the end notes, interpretation, it's a word that is used to translate epiboli, epiboli, right? Epi, we know that that means like episode, epicenter, the, the, the most focused part of something. And then the second part of the word, epiboli, is like hyperbole or symbol, right? So epiboli means direct insight. That's what that's what the translator says. It means the center of the of the thrust, the center of the thrust, right? Just like symbol means drawing to bringing together what's been kind of thrown. Symbols like conjecture, remember. <clears throat> so another interpretation. He's being, uh, he's being, uh, he's speaking with faith here. This isn't conjecture. He's being firm on the truth of this. Just to note. Four lines, and, and just to note his tone for a moment, four lines down from that, we have a line which really almost made me trip. It's so intimate all of a sudden. Maximus speaks in such intimate terms all of a sudden. And we realize that his reverential tone throughout is uh, is is um, of an integral adoration. It's not out of a dearth of feeling, but his intimate reference to his savior, and then to the magnitude of what that intimacy means, is is really something, really something. Just four lines under that. Another interpretation of Saint Gregory's words, and then. <clears throat> Over on page 45, and I want to read out this uh, this session section. This is four lines down from the top of page 45. Um, <clears throat> and it's 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 uh, when Maximus is discussing the idea of the person of the human being as sheep, right? So man is a sheep. Because he is a follower and is ranked in an order, and because his, <clears throat> he provides his owner with three useful things, wool, lambs, and milk. Because man is both nourished and provides nourishment through the principle and mode of natural contemplation. And he is clothed and clothes by the mode of ethical philosophy. And he is enriched and enriches by giving birth to others like him through the mystery of true vision. He calls man a silver coin, since he is shining and royal, and by virtue of being an image, he bears the characteristic mark of the divine archetype, and also because he is able to receive, within the limits of what is possible for him, the whole of the divine beauty. And he is called the son, since he is the inheritor of the father's good things, and equal in honor to the father, according to the gift of grace. Ship silver coin sun the the thing i want to note here is that all of the movement in this passage is synergetic it's a doubled movement so both nourished and provides nourishment clothed and clothes enriches and and, and is enriched and then also the 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 awe filled the awe filled intimacy of calling man God's son and saying that, <clears throat> excuse me, that man will receive as possible the whole of, of a measure which is utterly beyond him. Receive as possible the whole of a measure which is utterly beyond him. Equal in honor to the father. All right. Moving over to page 49, please. 49. This is 49 to, through 51. Um, it's the last, <clears throat> no, six lines up from the beginning of the pair, well, about halfway through the page, beginning instead in a manner that is natural to himself, approximately just halfway to the page, instead in a manner which is natural to himself. And here, we'll read this, but we won't comment much. I just want us to note the language of nature 
or nat uh, natural or nature. Instead, in a manner that is natural to himself, he actively performs and passively experiences the things of nature in a manner beyond nature, in both instances paradoxically preserving himself inviolate while experiencing them, along with the things he performs and brings about, so that the integrity of their natural immutability remains unchanged. Thus he himself being moved to draw near to us, note that that almost passive language, we return to it, being moved to draw near to us in the lower world, truly became perfect man, consistent, consistent with all the positive marks of humanity, without in any way moving outside of himself, without in any way moving outside of himself. or experiencing any limitation to a particular place. And he completely divinized us without in any way violating or essentially altering our nature for having totally given the whole of himself and assuming the whole of man and, and assuming the whole of man in an ineffable and perfect union. He in no way suffered any diminishment of his perfection. And in truth, the same one is whole God and whole man, and bearing witness within his own self by the perfection of the two natures in which he truly exists, to the unchangeable and unalterable, unalterable condition of both. This is how God abolishes the laws of nature. He engages himself with nature amid the things of nature in a way beyond nature. So, in a manner that is natural, things of nature in a manner beyond nature. And he also completely, without any, without any way of violating or essentially altering our nature, becomes one with us. So, nature here is, is starting to sound like being as something beyond time. But this is a, an open uh, question we, we, we ought to come back to deepened a little bit just further down this page, page 51, uh, seven lines into the next paragraph, beginning with, for in as much, for in as much. For in as much as he came to be below for our sakes and without change became man, exactly like us, but without sin, exactly like us. That's the key phrase. But without sin is added on. Loosing the laws of nature in a manner beyond nature, it follows that we too, thanks to him, will come to be, will come to be in the world above and to become gods, huh. become gods according to him through the mystery of grace. Undergoing no change whatsoever in our nature. Become gods according to him through the mystery of grace is a sentence that is uh, endless or a phrase which is endless. But what to note here? Well, Maximus states that theosis involves no change in our nature. So the question I asked earlier, does it involve a change in our being? That's still a question. Also, he says Christ became man exactly like us consistent with us that's the key and yet without sin right without straying beyond presence we know that sinning means just to stray beyond presence and we also know that it's inhumane and inhuman to stray beyond presence so we are not ourselves when we are not present on page 53 we're not going to read, but just to refer to a phrase and comment for a minute. We have the phrase, our completion in Christ and through Christ. Completion in Christ and through Christ. We are complete in Christ when our soul isn't moved to stray. right? When we stay integral and stay present in relation with each other. And... 
our completion is in Christ, and we come to this presence through our efforts in synergy with Christ. So our completion is in Christ, and it's via our efforts in synergy with Christ. Or, just to use a Heraclitus' phrase for a moment, in the harmony beyond our knowing. Or, in Maximus's term, you know, phrasing, the beauty, our beauty beyond ourselves. <laughs> our co-responsiveness to a truth which calls our name, calls out unto us from beyond our horizon. Our co-responsiveness there forms the heart of our synergy. Okay. And then to Ambiguum 32, please. Um, And just to just to walk briefly through this. So this is from Saint Gregory's oration on the on the on the nativity again. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, whose government is upon his shoulder, for he is exalted by means of the cross. Such beautiful, beautiful, beautiful language. On page 55, Maximus muses on the form of the cross and the idea of the governing or the governance that uh, is on Christ's shoulders, as it were. The form of the cross. <clears throat> he says, the cross, by virtue of the conception surrounding it, admits of many contemplations. Right? By which he's saying, when we think in terms of form and relation, we always see new connections. Always see new connections. And further down that page, just this is I'm I'm conveying a, the footnote more or less of the of the uh, of the translator regarding governing the proper governing cause and origin. The translator says Father Max, Maxim says that um, or Father Nicholas sorry says that uh, this governing is a translation for for both aitia or aitia and arche to Greek etiology as we know or archaeology. Uh, to, to render them familiar. And basically he's saying all inauguration, all inauguration forms or is forming in time, right? Each beginning augurs. We have this word, augur is to not only begin, but also to set forth the predict, to, to set the course of. So Christ's governance opens our horizon, makes sense of our horizon. And this governance could also be understood as, as Christ's establishing, arranging, sustaining, ordering of the cosmos, or Christ's authority. Right? Turn to page 59, please, 59. Just going to read the second half of the page, 59, so where we come back to this idea of governing and, and form. Second half of 59. Beginning, any one of us, therefore, who desires a place. <clears throat> any one of us, therefore, this is page 59. Any one of us, therefore, who desires a place in such a government, must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, quoting Christ, which means, Maximus speaking, which means that he must take up the life of ascetic practice, which mortifies the passion, and lay hold of the goodness and beauty of his bounty, for Christ desires that all should exercise government in the manner that he did. All our, all our actions should be formative in time should consider for me. for when the god-bearing teacher said <clears throat> he is elevated by means of the cross i believe that with these words he was emphasizing emphasizing for us the fact that when the rational nature of man is, is exalted through ascetic practice and the dispassion that is paired with it christ himself is said to be exalted by which i mean the form of christ it's a phrase from dionysius the Areopagite. 
the form of Christ inherent within human beings, for it is this that rises upward in proper sequence and order, and through dispassionate practice moves to the cognitive contemplation of nature, and from there to initiation in theology. All right, what do we have here? Well, first, Christ desires our own, our own Christ-like governing for us to, to make his governant, his governing, his government, our own. In other words, he desires our essential movement and our sensible and intelligible engagement with the elemental aspects of life. And then he also says the form of Christ, the form of Christ, which is inherent within human beings. For it is this that rises upward. There's something within us which yearns for our Lord, almost beyond ourselves, almost beyond ourselves. But it's the key of our energy, that drawing near. And in the end, he moves from well, from movement rising upwards through participation to dwelling with. So the rising upward movement, participation, dispassionate practice, and contemplation of nature, that's participation. And from there to initiation in theology, that's dwelling with, that's holy presence. And then over to page 61. We're getting into more reading now. About eight lines down, having looked rightly upon, having looked rightly upon his own condition, to the bottom. Having looked rightly upon his own proper condition with dispassionate eyes, he will depart from the gloomy recesses of ignorance. But being imperfect, being imperfect, he will not, of his own accord, at once desire the most perfect unity and participation in God. But little by little will be carried, will be carried in an orderly and sacred manner. There's hierarchy through the first things to things more primary, and through these to things most primal, and when perfected, to the supreme summit of communion with the divine. That's apophatic movement right there. Continuing, it is in this manner, then, according to that great and godly-minded teacher, that the only exalted one is exalted by means of the cross, for he is spiritually exalted through us who are, who are exalted according to him, when, through ascetic practice coupled with dispassion, we are led up to knowledge, and with minds free of matter, we are raised up from there to mystical contemplation and initiation into divine realities. And even, I make bold to add, to participation in God. The first part of that passage um, describes apophatic movement. And we realize that the essence of apophatic thinking and movement is pacing. It's patience. The most important thing for apophasis is patience. Little by little will be carried. Little by little. All of our action is both ultimate and minor, or modest, as Goa likes to say. Important but modest. God draws us near. And then he says, in an orderly and sacred manner. So our form of life includes holy form and place and pacing. And then in the just at the bottom of that of that of that same reading. 
the only exalted one is spiritually exalted through us who are exalted <clears throat> according to him when through ascetic practice coupled with dispassion the only exalted one is exalted by us through our formal struggle through the form of our struggle that's first and then just the language of we are led up to we are led up to knowledge this is the language of being drawn near of drawing near and then the final points he concludes with uh, with moving from vision to initiation contemplation or vision to initiation to participation and we realize that the most in intimately truthful is the most excuse me intimately personal Pardon me. The most intimately truthful is the most intimately personal. Okay. Ambiguum 33, um, turning the page over to page 63. Ambiguum 33. I just want to paraphrase for now. Um, we may return to it. I want to paraphrase it and move right into a big Yom 34 and into more uh, more reading. But a big Yom 33 is from St. Gregory's same oration on the nativity. And the phrase is, the logos becomes thick. The logos becomes thick. And Maximus divides his response into three sections, either or and or in the first either he talks about what one could call the purity of christ's flesh right christ's flesh which encompasses and surpasses our common associations or relations of the flesh what we usually associate or relate with the flesh christ encompasses and surpasses and so christ's incarnation forms a new context for our living together, for our being as communion. And this means that Christ, as our incarnate mystery, is at once holy and yet beyond us. Holy present and yet beyond us. And Maximus reminds us that the parable form phrases this kind of truth well. And what, does par what do parables teach us? The parables teach us that the divine energies of God dance and play and delight and are wholly present. Just to think about parables for a moment. Parables gesture intimately. They gesture intimately and proclaim meaning beyond our arguments and expectations and images. They gesture intimately and proclaim meaning beyond our expectations. Parables remain full of truth, with overflowing with truth, even after being paraphrased and comprehended endlessly and variously. And parables are completed, or, or rather our lives complete our apprehension of the meaning of parables. Parables can become complete in our lives just as uh, our lives become complete in Christ. And Maximus also says, Christ who is everywhere present and fills all things is the communion at the center of our cosmos. Christ is the communion at the center of our cosmos. And Christ's presence, he is present, but not as we expect or presume, or cast in our own image. The logos becomes thick. We must reattune ourselves to Christ's purity, reattune ourselves to his being beyond all of our contexts and all of our excuses, all of our alibis. And as we struggle to reattune ourselves in the presence of Christ, we learn to listen for, for deeper, for different, uh, distant harmonies 
right? that we didn't know we knew. And in this, Christ teaches us to feel again, right? to feel anew. All right. Ahmed, are you there? Can I ask you to do to to read something, or are you not there? Yes, of course I'm there. Would you mind reading uh, Ambiguum 34, please, the whole thing? So let's listen to the whole thing. Then we'll walk through it, and then we'll listen to the whole of Ambiguum 35 and walk through it, and listen to the whole of Ambiguum, and we'll walk through it, and then we'll begin to talk. But let's listen to Maximus at slightly more length for a little bit. Please, Ahmed. Ambiguum 34. Uh, the, right over to, to the end of page 67. From St. Gregory's same oration on the nativity. Not from those things that he is in himself can we know God, but from those things that are around him, selecting one impression from out of another and combining them into some sort of image of the truth. From those things that pertain to God's essence, that is, from the essence itself, it has never at any time been known what God is, for to have even an idea of what God might be is impossible and completely beyond the reach of all creation, whether visible or invisible. Moreover, from those things that are around the essence, we learn only that God exists. And when these things are contemplated properly and piously, God yields himself up to those who gaze upon him. But all the things that are around the essence do not disclose what the essence itself is, but what it is not, such as not being created, not having a beginning, not being finite, not being corporeal, and any other such things that are around the essence and indicate what it is not, but not what it is. And this is true even of the principles of providence and judgment, according to which the universe is wisely governed and with which the harmonious contemplation of nature around God is set to take place, which shows only by analogy that its creator exists. To be sure, negations stand in opposition to affirmations, becoming amicably interwoven with each other around God, each entering into and reciprocally complementing the other. Thus, the negative statements indicate not that the divine is something, but rather what it is not. And these are in compliance with the affirmations around that something, which the divine is not. And the affirmations, which indicate solely that the divine exists, but not in any way what it is, are united with the negations around that something, which the divine is not. To the extent that the negations and affirmations are taken in relation to each other, they express opposition through antithesis, but when they are referred to God, they reveal their intimate relation by the manner in which the two extremes mutually condition each other. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. All right, let's walk through just uh, kind of kind of signposts through this uh, this amazing new work. And we can come back again. A couple of notes from St. Gregory's own phrasing, not from, but from, at the very beginning, this is on page 65, <clears throat> not from those things, but from, the word from, which is key here. So apophatic movements uh, by which our thinking seeks to draw near the divine is movement of movement of, and movement unto. Cataphatic movements, by which we receive the gifts of life from God, is from, from. So these are cataphatic things that he's talking about. He's talking about what we can say positively. This is the gift we've been talking about. Then, in the second half of St. Gregory's uh, 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 qu quotation, uh, selecting one impression from out of another and combining them in some sort of image of the truth. Impressions, combinations, some sort of image, truth. All right. Selecting, well, that's discerning. So discerning what draws near and seeking in it the integral, right? Seeking in it the integral. 
And also, then he says, combining them into some sort of image of the truth. That's what we do in our person. We compose what we have gathered as an offering to God. We compose it within the very fabric of our being, our being in prayer. That's what we are, we are constantly seeking our own integrity for God. Now, continuing on page 65, <clears throat> moving into Maximus's language now. From these things, that is, from the essence itself, it has never at any time been known what God is. Right. From, not of. N nothing comes from the essence of God, and we do not speak of the essence of God. Right. But more importantly, the gift should not make us arrogant. The clearest of our gifts from God is received with thankful humility, right? Not with anticipation or presumption of what lies beyond its context or what else should be there, of what else might necessarily be there. We accept the gift as a gift. And then the next line, for to even have an idea of what God might be is impossible and completely beyond. God is beyond our horizon. God gives. God gives. Creation is a gift. We talked uh, many sessions ago about the, the idea of, of, of poesis, the Greek word of creating or making, also being a kind of form of giving, right? Creation is a giving. If creation is a gift, then life is experienced ecstatically as what both is and also is beyond right both is and is beyond. it's a gift we don't see the links we don't see the relation we don't have a context for this right and then that god is beyond a horizon maximus reiterates we learn only that god exists only that god exists well the divine calling unto us calling unto our souls from beyond a horizon lets us attend Let's us attend the call from beyond our horizon. Let's us attend to the mystery whose great love we begin to feel. It's become thick. We begin to feel and intimately with our deepened attunements. Right? Let's us attend the mystery. We know that God is. We cannot grasp. We cannot reach out. Maximus says, God yields himself up, right? This is the divine giving unto. And so the presence of God is felt beyond our grasp. God yields himself up. And the presence of God is a gift. It's a gift that surpasses all horizon. It's not due to us. We've seen this word, word yield used richly before in Ambiguum 10. Uh, page 213 of that other volume we won't go to it now but it's on page 213 um, yielding is also a lover's move to yield to offer oneself to give oneself so god yields himself up and he says what is uh, what is disclosed in that yielding what is disclosed and what is not disclosed All the things that are around the essence do not disclose what the essence itself is, but what it is not. So what is around the essence, what we mistake for the essence, tells us what God isn't. God's great gift is of truth. It stands in the clearing, aletheia. But as we draw near, apophatically, we discern and must navigate our own illusions that with which we keep thinking we've arrived at the clearing. We've arrived, we're there, we're present, but we're not. We're locked inside our own, our own image. And then the passage at the end, this wonderful passage in which Maximus finally set, has cataphasis and, ap and apophasis dance around each other as one, right? As one, not, not they aren't one, but as one. Apophasis and cataphasis are complementary. They're found in intimate relation. When they're treated as distinctions or divisions, they seem to be over against each other, right? 
Apophasa says, no, this is beyond. It's beyond this. And Cataphasa says, this is the gift here. It is the gift here. The gift is here and the gift is beyond. That is and is beyond is the, um, the ontological gift of Christ to us. Um, moving on to Ambiguum 35. Anna, would you mind reading uh, one out for us? Ambiguum 35 from, well, from the top of 69, just over to its end on page 71, please, if you will. And then we'll talk about it a little bit just move before Ambiguum 36. Sorry, 35 in its entirety. Please, please, including Gregory's uh, extract, yeah. From St. Gregory's same oration on the nativity, but since this did not suffice to goodness, to move solely within self-contemplation, it was necessary that the good should overflow and make progress so that a great number of beings would benefit. When I asked that great and wise elder whom I already mentioned several times about this passage, he told me that with these words, the great and God-bearing Gregory wished to make it clear that God is one in himself as being strictly one, possessing absolutely nothing different within his nature that may be contemplated together with him, but instead uniquely possesses within himself an inconceivable, eternal, infinite, and incomprehensible permanence from which, by virtue of an ever-giving effusion of goodness, he brought forth beings out of nothing and endowed them with existence and also willed to impart himself without defilement to them in a manner proportionate to all and to each, bestowing upon each the power to exist and to remain in existence according to the great and godlike saint Dionysius the Areopagite, I don't know how to pronounce that, who said, the oneness of God must be praised for by transcending all things and owing to its goodness, it brought into being the entire order of intelligible beings and, by, and the beauty of the visible ones so that, according to some ineffable principle of wisdom, he exists without diminution in each of the created things in a manner proportionate to each, without being contained by them in any way, being present in some by the excess of his munificent effusion, in others by a more measured impartation, and in others so that they are able to reflect only a glimmer of his goodness, Perhaps then, this, as far as my foolishness allows me to see, is what is meant by the effusion of the good and its progress, namely, that the one God is multiplied in the impartation of good things proportionally to the recipients. <coughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. What an amazing passage and 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 response uh we see here again that maximus divides his his own response into three uh, he moves and it's curious he 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 the, the hierarchy is interesting first he 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 draws near the elder and then draws near dionysius and then finally allows himself a little word the passage from saint gregory one may not touch, uh, um, but I think that 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 one can reflect a little bit on on what on on what light seems to come from it. First, it seems to me interesting that even at its most intimate, our language tends unto movement. There's lots of moving words, words of movement, aesthetic movement within. Gregory's phrase. Self-contemplation is a strange term. Self-contemplation reminds us of self-truth or tautology. 
And we recall that tautology or self-truth, the afto form of truth, according to John Zizoulis, was the Greek element of philosophy that the Cappadocians, the Apophatic Fathers, Gregory uh, of Nazian, there's Gregory of Nyssa, Basil the Great, refused to countenance and would not allow to form part of the horizon of truth, right? The phrase, it was necessary, is astonishing and, and it must contain some great, great insight uh, into the divine mystery. Uh, uh, it must. But okay, now moving to Maximus's. So the elder proclaims the oneness beyond oneness. And Dionysius, Maximus says, Dionysius proclaimed the givingness of the one. And Maximus, Maximus himself talks about the gift. So we have the one, the giving, and then the gift in this. The elder's reference or the elder's phrasing of the oneness beyond oneness. It's so that we don't make one or oneness an idolatrous projection. And I think also so that we don't make the casual assumption or casual presumption that our composite being simply reflects the divine. Uh, our forms of oneness, which Heraclitus knows better than all of us, um, here are not, they're, 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 they're still in our horizon. The oneness beyond oneness also draws us near and unto, and even into the clearing, into truth. For the oneness of God is revealed in the communion of the Godhead. The oneness is revealed in communion, or even as communion, which is um, a sheer thought. Then Maximus moves on to Dionysius. This is 69 over to 71. Dionysius talks about the givingness, the gift. So communion then is not self-true. It's not self-contained. It's not self-exhausting. It's transformative. And as we said, transformation needs another, right? Transformation needs another. And so divine giving is a kind of ecstatic, a standing out beyond giving events. And the divine gift weaves relation where it is otherwise impossible. It bridges the, the distinction of humanity and divinity. Mm -hmm. And then on page 71, Maximus, who, who, who we understand that he, his prayer would be, his foolishness would be acceptable to God, what he calls his foolishness. He talks about the gift, our gift. And he says, our incarnate gift, our logos, becomes our measure, our measure, and fulfills our being as he knows well. Christ is our pantocrator, our all measurer, as David loves to, uh, so, so, well, as David puts so beautifully, the pantocrator. Christ is our measure. Christ is our, our model. Okay. Moving on to Ambiguum 36. I'm going to read this and then we will walk through a couple of thoughts and then we'll see. So Ambiguum 36, <clears throat> uh, from beginning to end. From St. Gregory's same oration on the Nativity. This is page 71, Ambiguum 36. This is Gregory's phrasing. He communicates a second communion, far more marvelous than the first. Isn't that amazing? It was not so amazing, I think, Maximus says, although it was clearly something great for God to bring into communion with himself through the infusion of breath, the first formation of human nature, which was pure since it was honored by his own hand. Granting to that likeness a share of the divine beauty according to his image, as it was for him to deign to draw near to it after it had, it had been stained and ran from him on account of the passions with which it was smeared, and to enter into intimate communion with it, to partake, 
So Christ grants likeness, draws near, enters into com intimate communion, partakes of what is familiar, uh, what is inferior, and to heighten the miracle by means of a marvelous union with things utterly beyond mixture with him. In the first instance, nature did not in any way whatsoever obtain unity with God according to mode or principle, either a substance or hypostasis, according to which all beings universally are seen to exist. Now, however, through the ineffable union, nature has obtained unity with God according to hypostasis, preserving unaltered on the level of its essence, its proper principle of difference in relation to the divine essence, with respect to which it has become one and not different, by virtue of having been united to it in a union according to hypostasis, so that with regards to the principle of its being, according to which it was created and exists, nature should continue to abide with its essence strictly intact and in every way undiminished, while with regards to the principle of how it does exist, it should receive its subsistence in a divine manner, so that it would neither know nor admit of absolutely any impulse of movement toward anything else. In this way, the word entered into communion with human nature in a way that was far more marvelous than the first, essentially uniting nature to himself in a union according to hypostasis. Okay. Back to the beginning, just walking through some of these phrasing before we move on. Far more marvelous. He communicates a second communion far more marvelous than the first. This language might strike one as, as, as odd, far more marvelous. Well, hmm. let's think. Communicates a communion. We're already where language is beyond itself. It, it's, it's, almost, it's an almost tautological use of language. He's reached the limits of what language can utter. The word marvelous, the word, Gregory's word, um, Maximus's word amazing in the first line, his word great in the second line. These are, these are, these are intellects taking ultimate and, and awesome care with language. Marvelous, amazing, and great. These are very precisely said. Distinctions uh, are key. It was not so amazing, but clearly something great to bring into communion with himself through the infusion of breath, through the infusion of breath. The Holy Spirit infuses us with breath. Right? We're given a rhythm of life, a rhythm of life to enjoy, a breathing rhythm of life, not a pattern of thinking to follow. Then, as it was for him to deign to draw near, Christ draws near. He seeks intimacy with our soul. This is Christ's movement as movement. Christ's movement we discern as movement, and that's how we can say it, drawing near. And to enter, still on page 71, enter into intimate communion with it. So, Christ desires, as it were, that we complete our being, we complete our being as well-being, as well-being. We complete our being as well-being through the eternal well-being of intimate communion with him, with Christ. Our com the completion of our being, our being doesn't change, it doesn't alter, but it's completed in well-being and then Time is transcended through proximity to the divine, and so eternal well-being and intimate communion. And he says, to heighten the miracle by means of a marvelous union. Marvelous, marvel. A marvel is something which passes possibility. So this is a union beyond possible unity, this marvelous union. It's a union beyond possible unity. And it's the same way we think of theosis, or the movement of synergy, or the truth of hypostatic being, a union beyond possible unity. The gift is beyond our horizon. Over to page 73, the top of 73. We have 
nature did not in any way obtain unity with God. And then we have now, however, nature has obtained unity with God. Okay. Unity according to, according to mode. Nature did not obtain unity with God according to mode or principle, right? According to. In the first communion, to use his language, Christ's presence was included via gesture. It was included via gesture, not articulated, but gesture. It was gathered in sense. In, <clears throat> and, and then in the second, the so-called second communion, the fullness of Christ's articulation blesses our mode of personhood. So, moving from gesture to fullness of articulation. And the fullness of articulation means the full articulation of our personhood, our hypostatic being, or the full articulation of our path of synergy and theosis. He also says the proper principle of difference in relation to the divine. So the first gift the first gift, the first communion, is confirmed as whole. It's a whole gift. There's nothing lacking. It's whole and it's holy. Right? Whole and holy. And the second gift completes, as it were, completes that wholeness, completes that holiness in Christ. He says, union according to hypostasis with regards to the principle of its being Nature should continue to abide with its essence strictly intact. So, the logos of our being is not temporal. It is beyond time, the logos of our being. And then he says, well, with regards to the principle of how it exists, it should receive, receive its subsistence in the divine manner. The logos of our mode of existence, which is temporal, needs Christ's gift, and Christ. His, his incarnation, his acceptance of our hypostatic being heals and, as it were, grants the subsistence to our personhood. And then just the final words. In this way, the word, the Logos, entered into communion with human nature in a way that was far more marvelous than the first essentially uniting nature to himself in a union according to hypostasis. Far more marvelous. Maximus has said that the joy, the truth of Christ's incarnation always gives more. It's endless. It always gives more. He says, we never perceive the horizon of the great gift of the incarnation of our Logos. We never perceive the horizon of the truth of person as hypothesis in synergy. The horizon is wide open. Okay, now, pardon me, holding this in mind, holding all this in mind, Michael, could I ask you to, could we circle back to Ambiguum 33? I'd like you to read the whole thing and then we'll start talking together. Ambiguum 33, I think, is a kind of counterpart, but slightly more mystical counterpart to what we just read. Ambiguum 33 is on page uh, uh, 63. But if you wouldn't mind, Michael, uh, reading, and then even if you will, or open it up or begin to walk us into conversation, holding Ambiguum 36 and what we just talked about in mind, bring us back into this, this mysterious phrase, the logos becomes thick. Please. Okay, why don't I, I read it? And then while I'm reading, others can think about what they might want to say, so I won't have to say something right after reading it. So, I agree and know the uh, feeling. Okay, uh, let me, Begum 33, from St. Gregory's same oration on the nativity, the logos becomes thick. When the God-bearing teacher says that the logos becomes thick, I think he does so with the following ideas in mind, either because the logos who is simple and incorporeal and who spiritually nourishes all the divine powers in heaven according to rank, deemed it worthy to become thick through his manifestation in the flesh, which was taken from us and for us, 
and is consistent with us, but without sin. So that he might instruct us by means of words and examples suited to us in mysteries that transcend the power of all human speech. For we know that all that he said was in the form of parables and that he said nothing without a parable. For teachers typically have recourse to parables whenever their pupils are not immediately able to follow them and so endeavor to lead them to an understanding of what is being said. Or one could say that the logos becomes thick in the sense that for our sake, he inevitably concealed himself in the logoi of beings and is obliquely signified in proportion to each visible thing, as if through certain letters being whole in whole things while simultaneously remaining utterly complete and fully present, whole and without diminishment in each particular thing. He remains undifferentiated and always the same in beings marked by difference, simple and without composition in things that are compounded, without origin in things that have a beginning, invisible, in things that are seen and incapable of being touched in all that is palpable. Or one could say that the logos becomes thick in the sense that for the sake of our thick minds, he consented to be both embodied and expressed through letters, symbols, and sounds, so that from all these, he might gradually gather those who follow him to himself being united by the spirit and thus raise us up to the simple and unconditioned idea of him bringing us for his own sake into union with himself by contraction to the same extent that he was for our sake expanded himself according to the principle of condensation condescension pardon me Thank you, Michael. Let, let's reflect on this in the light of, of Ambiguum 36. Let's begin to draw some correspondences, as we will, as we will. Can I can I just throw out a kind of parenthetical remark? It's not really getting at the content at all, but just you know more of the presentation. Of mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. of the things that struck me about um, this ambiguum and several others is the um, um, the hermeneutic aspect of it. It seems to represent uh, uh, what I take to be the one one of the origins of the principle of principle that is subsequently be called. Um, by philosophers at any rate, the principle of charity or hermeneutic openness. And I'm, I'm referring to um, Augustine's uh, famous discussion in the, in the um, Confessions when he's taught, trying to um, explicate, provide an exegesis, not his own, but an exegesis uh, of, of um, he's, he's um, recapitulating an exegesis um, exegesis of multiple, a multitude of people who have over the years in Jewish and Christian traditions tried to make sense of the opening verses of Genesis. And it's quite striking because he goes through quite a few interpretations and he doesn't, he doesn't um, reject any of them. And he says that they all might conduce to the truth of the passage that he's we're trying to understand and that the 
principle of charity is such that every interpretation should be guided by an attempt to attribute truth. But it, it almost seems like a kind of um, apophatic gesture. We can't actually e easily or finally say what the truth we're attributing is. So what which um, interpretation is correct. And so, so Maximus, in a way, he, he's providing a series of interpretations. He's not, he's not doing this in some kind of regimented fashion where one is displacing the other, like some hellish parliament where, where interesting ideas are put forward and then dashed. They're, they're all simultaneously kept alive. And, and it needn't be discouraging. I mean, it obviously points to the limitations of our attempt to understand what Gregory might be saying in a particular instance in, in some final nice way, but it's, um, it, it also bespeaks a kind of um, humility. I mean, Augustine at the end of the day says, none of us um, has uh, any notion finally what the opening verses of Genesis mean in light of you know, subsequent science and so on. But that it's true is something we should assert, just as we, as, as um, Maxima says about God, that God exists is all we can assert. And less emphatically than that, there are some things that, some assertions of Gregory's that aren't quite that elusive, but they're that they're expressing something is worth taking on board that we shouldn't always try to finalize what we're saying. Sorry, I didn't mean to be quite <laughs> long-winded making what, what after all is a kind of um, perhaps a slightly trite point, but it's also, there's, there's an interesting um, tension with respect to truth and our inability to flesh out the truth to give it a kind of propositional finality i'll stop there and perhaps someone else has something more substantive to, to um, comment on michael I, I think that's in my opinion far from trite this makes me think of the theme that andrew brought up at the beginning about thinking about distinction and unity the idea that and the way you talked about uh Augustine, right? I believe you you mentioned Augustine, bringing a a multiplicity of exegeses and never discounting any a hermeneutic openness. I think that's another term you you. And so I see in that, in the way you articulated that as well, the notion that one has to be careful that the 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 dichotomy between distinction and unity. And never, and I'm staying away from distinction. And here, the what I take from the low course becomes thick because it's such a, it's very profound. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what is intended there exactly, but but your remark made me think that that thickness, that thickness, is a unifying, or a or. The, an acceptance or the acceptance of the multiplicity of exegeses or or understandings, the hermeneutic openness is itself a kind of the spirit of, of unity. It's like you accept you and things always tend to kind of gather around something like there's a there's a certain sense in which, yeah, you, we don't see things as distinctions. The other thing I was I kind of caught while you were talking is this is very far away, for example, from a more postmodern understanding of, of, of difference or distinction where there's multiplicity, but it's a multiplicity which is very, uh, there's no cohesiveness, there's no coherence, there's no, there's no unity, there's no unity. And so I, I'm now rambling, but your, your thoughts provoked something uh for me that relate to what andrew mentioned earlier about 
distinction and unity as a major theme uh, of understanding. So I'll, yeah, yeah, that 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 was my yeah thought when you said that. Yeah, thank you. That that that, that that's a nice um, aptly a nice interpretation of my interpretation. It's, um, <clears throat> just let me let me circle back on something and I'll I'll stop again. Um, um, Michael, the the hermeneutic. David has has things to say about about that hermeneutic too, in the um, rabbinical tradition. I think with the unwillingness to cancel commentary on scripture. In in um, I heard it from Goa, anyways. <clears throat> That's that principle of charity, which is. Well, which is which is the, the the principle of being in Christ. Let the little ones come unto me. Let all come. Let all come. Right. We've in the seminar we've we've referred to the the in the past the the difficulty of of joining this meaning with this meaning by saying how do we layer meaning onto a concrete event, right? When we start to see symbolism or this event completed in terms of a story or a narrative what are we abstracting from that event we have to be very very careful this <clears throat> this this thing that i think that you're talking if i understand you michael and if i understand you ahmed what you're talking about it is also framed in terms of the aesthetic problem of the double or seeing this as that as we said earlier god as man christ as person so it's seeing this as that maximus says we can see this phrase the logos becomes thick as this we can see it as this and it's in that doubling it's in the completion of the meaning within the lived context that lends that that instance uh profundity or not validity or not and and that's i think that's the importance of why we say that meaning is not complete until it's encountered it has to be encountered and so these various encounter encounterings that um or encounters that augustine relates or that you have in mind michael in each moment if the meaning of those verses become complete that's holy that's something right because we know via maximus the truth is not phrased and formulated and memorized it's participated in and so even the idea of certainty or finality of sentences only is meant to be there so that we can begin to participate but so having that then I, but i wanted to come back and ask you uh, holding that in mind ask you michael you said it's a it's a hermeneutic move he makes a few times i agree with you i hadn't thought of it in those terms that's beautiful what do you make then of in ambiguum 31 when he calls another direct insight of this so he doesn't seem to be saying this is a play on it it could be seen he's saying this is a truth and this is or are we misemphasizing his 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 meaning there just follow that thought i think you have a really what, good what, thought what page is that on oh that was well in ambiguum 31 so it's near the beginning uh 40 it's on 43 and he repeats the phrase another contemplation of the same but i was thinking the phrase of, on 43 another interpretation which as the translator reminds us you see in the in the subtitle there another interpretation the translator reminds us that means another direct insight or uh, uh epiboli um i don't know if that changes anything at all but but i, I was curious because I, I like i like your approach here yeah i don't i don't know that the, the fact that there's not one interpretation um it seems to be relevant i mean that that provides a context for um, interpreting Epibole. You know, I thought of something as I'm thinking about this, what I've found really uh, useful in my own way of, of thinking about these things is it's just from my own work, which is on um, Russian symbolism and the notion of a symbol in the Russian context, I think it can be applied here too. The idea that in something, they had this almost like an image of a cone. Symbol is both extremely particular on one end, but also infinitely open on the other, right? So that, you know, 
you can both so that you are able to and i think for biblical interpretation i think this is really i mean at least for me has been revelatory that you can both say for example that the theotokos was a real living jewish girl at a particular time and a particular place so that's the particularity of it but then at the same time, it would not contradict, but in fact, would open up on the other end to say that she is also Theotokos and the mother of God. And you can say multiple other things about her that would not negate her particularity, but would open up interpretations on the other end, right? So that, um, and I, and, and, so that when he says, and another interpretation could be, it seems to me it's he's making that same move that there's this brilliance in which it's not a postmodern thing where all things are being are equal, but rather that something, some concrete insight can have multiple interpretations, which kind of complement each other but never negate well he says the logos as i i underline he consented to be both embodied and expressed through his letters syllables and sounds right so that even the smallest syllable, I think St. Macrina said this as well, the smallest syllable reflects the open-ended glory of God on the other end and multiple ways of seeing it. That was just, it's just a thought. Yeah, that, that's, that seems to me to be such a fundamental heuristic and it, and it helps to stave off a lot of, um, um, I don't know, reductive um both reductive defenses and, and also challenges of certain specific things in scripture you know it, it was so interesting to, by the way so this is i've been working on this whole symbolism thing and thinking about symbolism and everything it means and then i realized that the saint dionysus right you know, the word is his symbol and he uses it in a very particular way. And it's gotten me to think about, you know, I think maybe I, I love that Maximus uses him so much because I think he's a neglected uh, father in some ways. I think he's, you know, the words theurgy and hierarchy and symbol are all his words and he uses them in these very particular ways. I, I anyway. I, I just think it would be so great to explore the word symbol as it was used patristically and then, but that's a side note. What do you make, Anna, of the fact that we call the creed the symbol of faith? Well, again, I mean, you know, I think Father Stephen Freeman has a blog. It, it, I don't know. It, but he says, we live in a one story universe now. And so everything is so literal, right? So you say, I believe in one God. And then everyone thinks, well, you you know, the identity question. Well, if you say that, it means one thing. And then you just say these concrete words. I think, Andrew, this is kind of like you're talking about. Every phrase in that is seen as completed and done. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible. You know what I mean? So that it it, it looks like uh, what Verdi I used to call um, not a communion, but enforced agreement or enforced commonality, right? So we all say the same thing and we all mean the same thing by it. And therefore we all come together and we all agree that these things are true, which is not wrong again, but if you think about it, it, if you think about the words being spoken, each one of them opens up to so much. 
And it's a song. Yeah. Which is why it's so great when the Orthodox churches sing it as opposed yeah. to just having everyone say it. It's not propositions. Yeah. I like that, by the way. I like thinking about it that way. Yeah. That's actually, I hadn't even, I believe in one God. Those are not just dead words, Andrew, right? They're not sort of these, you know, say them and then they fall down and they're heavy and that's it. Have you heard Peart's um, setting of this? Whose? You know Peart's work? Oh, not that particular one, no. Yeah, makes your hair stand on it. <laughs> I mean, when you listen to that, it's, because I haven't really, I love the, I love the creed, but I haven't really thought of it as a set of propositions for a long time, if ever. <laughs> I mean, they tried to get me to think of it as propositions when, you know, you read, ontological proofs for God and stuff like that. But the creed, my God. It's a yearning. It's a deep yearning. Thanks for that, David. I, you know, I'll go back and listen. Bach has, um, is it St. John's Passion? Oh, yeah. His creed is pretty. Speaking of music and song, David, your comment on song, and we're talking about music right now. I think before we started recording, we were talking about the Decad. That was also in, uh, in that uh, passage from another interpretation of St. Gregory's words, where Maximus characterizes the... the, the Take us there, Ahmed. Which page? Take us there. Uh, page 43 so it's uh near the bottom of the page where the passage starts with another interpretation of saint gregory's words <clears throat> and i just bring this up because i i first of all anna's remark about that, that a single syllable a word can mean so much uh and then david thickening that with the idea that it's a song and it made me think of uh, or it recalled Maximus describing the human being as a silver coin. This is uh, three lines from the very bottom of page 43. Uh, as a silver coin that fell from the divine decad. And there's a note, a translator's note in the back. It reads, um, it reads the following. The decad may be the nine orders or choirs of angels with the addition of humanity. So that the falling from that is a falling away from maybe understanding symbol and creed as song or more resonance and less as a, as I think Anna described uh, like a, a consensus, like a, it's a consensus. It's a, That's a good word. Thank you. Consensus, yes. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. The song, the song <laughs> this reverberation of, of, of what a syllable can do, even a single syllable, is uh, I think is a is a very, very profound way of understanding it. And I think a pro a, a more appropriate way, I, I would say. Um, which is why I think what Maximus is doing is very admirable and very difficult because he is he's glossing on on the song of Dionysus the Areopagite. I, I would call it a song what he's doing, what yeah. Dionysus is doing. Yeah. Yeah. Glossing on it. And we are now reading the gloss as a song as well. As these layers of reverberations and thickness, this thickening. Um, 
So it's musical in that sense, I'd say. It's song-like in that sense, you know. Um, I think that's beautiful, the musical connection. I would add one thing here. We have to be very careful. Um, if Gregory's thinking is, you know, song or prayer, if Denise's is thinking is song or prayer, if Maximus is thinking is song or prayer, let's be clear. These are festive songs sung after a season or in the season of living these truths. These aren't the expression of these truths. These are the articulation of truths that are lived during a season of life and then articulated out of joy, not, not to shore up meaning, just, just to remind ourselves that this is what we're living and this is beautiful. Thank so you all so, with... so much. I'm sorry to interrupt. I have to run uh, to get home, but this was wonderful food for thought. I appreciate it. I'll see you guys in, in two weeks. Thank yeah. you. Thank you all very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Andrew, sorry to cut in. I, I just wanted to Go on. just slip in. This is something you've brought up constantly, this idea of occasional writing. Like a lot of this is it's not intentional, but occasional. Uh, you, you, you've cited on multiple occasions the, the, the anecdote of, I don't think it was, I, I believe it was St. Sophroni's teacher who is... Um, Who is Saint Sophroni's teacher, Andrew? Siloan. Um, Siloan. I think you mentioned a, a a couple of multiple times now. The idea of someone comes up to me and says, "What would you guys do? What would the monks do if if the libraries right, right, right? Um, oh, you know, we would write them all over again. You know, there there's no reason, there's no intention. We we would just write them all over again." I think in that sense, you when you say this is a the the song of a lived moment and of a lived truth, and it's not trying to create meaning. Uh, I think that has to do with that approach as well. That approach of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. The 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 symbol of faith uh, culminates the articulation of the expression of our meaning. It doesn't establish it. It's like, it's like the verbal expression of love once a week fulfills all of the energy and activity of that whole week. It doesn't establish the tone for that week. It confirms what's already there. It's, it's a response. Co-response. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go on, dear. Yeah. I might have I might have had a, an easier path into Christianity if if I had looked at the um, doctrine of the resurrection, which was kind of a um, stumbling block for for about a decade or so. Um, not that I was I wasn't you know formulating a you know I. I can't believe this, therefore I'm not, don't count myself as a Christian. It was kind of more of a natural, spontaneous response to Paul's um, challenge that if you can't believe in the resurrection would be characterized as, you know, beyond the, the um, kind of scientific rational thoughts of the time, you know, the Greek culture in which he's uh, immersed, uh, you know, kind of largely materialistic culture, one can't really count oneself as a as a Christian. And then I, I found a way. Well, you know, I, I can actually believe the resurrection if I don't think that if I can simultaneously have all sorts of, um, you know, believe it on a sea of doubts. But what I, I take everyone to be su suggesting is that you can lay aside the propositional value, whether you doubt or don't doubt, and receive it as, um, um, I, I guess by analogy, more um, 
musically and metaphorically. But, but catch me up if that's a blunt way of um, recapitulating um, what everyone is sort of. I think it's hard. I think it's hard to think critically of the truths of tradition. And words like doubts are critical words. If we, if we, if we, if we shift the, the register, or if we say think of incarnate doubt rather than intellectual doubt, it changes everything. I was thinking this this week how how much richer, how much richer musical terminology is than literary or even theological terminology for describing I had everything. In 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 a musical phrase, one does not have to resolve a lack of harmony immediately. There can be a point leading to some resolution which leads to different vistas or I lose my language here. But music has more capacity for variation within it than a, a line of thinking which tries to follow certainty. That's one thing that strikes me. Um, we're not told certainty, we're told with faith, that's confidence. With faith leaves a whole range, expanse of things which we can encounter as beautiful and unknown and beyond our ken and not fret at all, at all. Yeah. Um, I yeah, I think I think this is why it was helpful right at, at the beginning that you reminded us of that um, for that um, aphorism attributed to to um, Dionysus. The harmony past knowing sounds more deeply than the known. I I could I could concur entirely with that and lay to rest the quest for um, certainty. And that's part of what I, I think I think probably in a slightly creaky way, and I kind of hesitate to share this with other people, not not with you, but with certain kinds of people for whom doubts can be um, debilitating and lead to a kind of paralysis. I actually um, took, I mean, the notion of doubt in a radically different way than it's taken among analytic philosophers who tend to doubt mm. in a kind of excoriating and um, reductive way. Mm. And and I, I and this could just, just be purely personal, and, and that's why I kind of hesitate to even you know share this. But I, I can also see doubt as a kind of um, living thing that draws you into um, doubting your doubts. In a sense, if that makes any sense, but it it can also um, open up um, a, a kind of apophatic attitude. So, but I I don't want to you know play um, you know semantics here because people normally invest in the very idea of doubt something which is hostile to their faith so so i i've sort of i'm very reluctant even to talk in these terms anymore so that's why you know i, I so i certainly appreciate um, the shift to another way of characterizing truth but let me throw out a heretical thought and it's a, it's a kind of heresy directed more against um, the analytic tradition, in, which has a very precise way of thinking about propositions or statements of truth. And it's um, I think it's a it's a it's a way of thinking about truth that goes back, at, at, well, probably to Plato and earlier, but it it gets a rather emphatic. Um, kind of imprint with Descartes and thinking of um, philosophical ideas as having to be clear and precise. And so this becomes a kind of model for propositional truth. Mm -hmm. And even someone like Davidson who upheld rather um, disruptively the importance of indeterminacy of meaning in a very serious and systematic way, um, he, he 
characterized, and th this is what I'm kind of going after, he characterized um, wrongly in my view, and this is the heretical thought, that metaphors as being meaningless. And the reason he did that, the, the premise on which he was inferring that metaphors are meaningless is because they're hugely suggestive and they're suggestive of um, anything. They're, they're radically indeterminate and therefore they can't express a proposition which has to be a clear and precisely formulated statement. So my, um, my heretical thought is that Davidson wasn't taking seriously his own indeterminacy view of meaning and I think that Maximus would probably be, could, could be more of a kindred spirit to the view that um, things that are divine are without horizons. And I think ultimately meaning is something that fits that model. Meaning is something non-empirical, something that we can't understand by human um, analysis or empirical um, means, meaning and thing, truth and value, agency, all of these concepts. And I, I would put into that category, since if I put the truth into that category, I would have to put propositional truth. So what I would say is that we can, we can talk without embarrassment of um, the creed as a series of propositions, provided that we're not thinking in the analytic mode that each proposition has to be have a clear and readily decipherable meaning and only one meaning. We can rather think of um, these as indeterminate propositions, as all propositions about important things are. And so the creed could be both metaphorical, but also be expressing truths, not as Davidson fallaciously said any truths because no metaphor that counts as a metaphor um, can express anything. It has to express, it has to close off a whole range of meanings to even function as a metaphor. The point of a, of a good metaphor is that it opens up our um, view of truth in a way that doesn't allow us to imagine that we can um, pluck out truth as something containable and once and for all. Now, I, I realize conventionally, this is how people use the term proposition. And so this is why it's a heretical thought, but I think um, we should um, import into um, you know, conventional discourse, including into philosophy, more of an apophatic um, mode of thinking. And I think one of the things <laughs> would be to um, challenge the conventional meaning of um, propositions. Sorry, that was a, a bit more of a manifesto than a, than a comment. And um, it might not be um, one for which there's a lot of signatories. <laughs> Just briefly, I agree with your critique of Davidson, but I mean, you taught me Davidson, so it's not that surprising. It is surprising that certainty gains such a hold, especially given the prominence of Augustine and what you, how you just, I mean, you taught me this too, but it's in Gadamer and Davidson and elsewhere. Augustine's <clears throat> interpretive, uh, interpretive uh, I mean, he had, he did have hermeneutic openness and interpretive charity. He was a very fine uh uh, interpreter right, of things. Yanaras says that Greeks fell into the temptation of certainty upon translating Aquinas. He locates the 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 event of uh, the prominence of, cer of certainty as the criterion of truth to be in the uh, rarefied uh, the rarefied Aristotelian form that Aquinas adopted and perfected. Um, he said the Greeks took it all from there. And then it enters into modern science and so on and Descartes, as you as you said too. I mean, depending on who which narrative you 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 hold. Yeah.
let me let me let me ask you about about a passage here, Michael. It might it might join in. It might not. It strikes me that everything you're saying is referring to Gregory's "The Logos Becomes Thick." I mean, that strikes me that you're just you're resonating with that. But in a slightly different vein, hearkening back to something you said a moment ago, page fifty-seven. This was just a couple of lines I was going to read, and then I left it. But I think it we it might it might be interesting. Beginning of the only full paragraph every government, but it's not those two words, it's, it's the interjection. For it is good to draw on examples from our own life to point to the truth of the realities that are above us. That's the phrase. Right. So I want us to just think about this for a minute. But but this is how I made sense of it. That that Christ is as we are. And one learns from the experience of being a person. And Maximus affirms that what is, is also is more than and is beyond. So what is, isn't contained or confined within a sentence or a proposition. It's always more than. The is and is more than. Anna was trying to get at this with her, with her brief account of Russian symbolism and her briefer account of Dionysian symbolism. Um, Maximus has a richer concept than either of them either Dionysus or Max or, or the Russians about symbolism. But the is and is more. The the, the truth uncontainable in propositions. Um, just that passage, what do we make of it? Yeah, I, 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 I think one part, part of the kind of modern disease is everything uh, becomes subjectified into epistemology. And this is a tradition that certainly goes far back, maybe um, to Socrates or to Plato, trying to define precisely what knowledge is. And, um, and I, I think, um, you, you were kind of echoing um, a passage, or, or, or at least I, I heard at the end of the first volume of the, the difficulties, when um, God is, it's said emphatically that God doesn't exist in any particular thing, but God is um, present in everything, in all, in, in all of the, the logos of everything. and all the logoi together. And so when, when, I th when we think of truth, we should think of being ontology. We shouldn't um, do this kind of um, modern thing where we're always, um, but when we do that, we have to think of reality as something that is just um, endlessly beyond us, always beyond us. And so when we think of the creed, as a series of propositions. It's not a series of propositions that closes reality. It, it begins to open us to the endlessness of reality and all of the specific things that we're committed to, that we're asserting, they can't, um, as, um, as uh, um, Ahmed would say, form a consensus, let alone a robotic consensus. They, they can if we fall into the trap of thinking of propositions as something that we invent to kick out precisely some part of reality. But if we think of them as um, propositions about important things, at any rate, as uh, opening up reality, then there, of course, can't be a consensus because uh, all of us are in a synergy that has no, um, or, or in a state of grace insofar as we're understanding it at all, what we're affirming that um, is, is never um, completable, except in the sense that there's a kind of a presence, but it's always a presence in relation to that, which is also um, ultimately um, always beyond us. I have had a, a, a kind of, uh, I don't know if it's an awful thought. Propositions 
are what Johns offer to streetwalkers, which is a way of turning, it's a way of focusing on something that's instrumental. I mean, it's, it's to reduce, to reduce to the instrumental, to reduce to some fantasy of utility. I mean, there's obviously tremendous significance in <clears throat> in um, in neo-scholasticism and in what Aquinas offered with such unbelievable uh, skill. But he himself, you know, did come to the conclusion that in the end, it's not the point. It may be leading somewhere, but there is a danger that it can become a barrier to an encounter, to an opening, to you know what he calls the beatific vision. It can prevent you from hearing that you are being addressed and called by life itself and by those we are privileged to meet every day. And there's no utility in that. And there isn't a arrangement. There's a wonder and an unfolding and to making new, because there's a presence. David, can I ask you something, just in light of what you just said? So what then does it mean, and maybe also just in uh, bringing in Aquinas, what does it mean to speak from within a tradition? Can one speak from within a tradition? And I guess what I'm trying to get at here is when traditions become institutionalized, and I hate using that word because it immediately, I don't mean it in a negative sense, but I mean it more in the sense of something that over centuries and sometimes a thousand years and more begins to acquire a certain recognizable form of engagement and address. So that when someone like Aquinas writes in the 13th century, he's writing from within a very well-established and according to very well-established forms of address. What does it mean then? How can one speak and speak truly from within a tradition and, and still be within the tradition? <laughs> well, I mean, my sense is, and, and all of you may have a better sense of this than I do, but my sense is that the scholastic uh, tradition of, uh, of the Latin church, um, I mean, it developed in such an extraordinary way It's impulse and then the period through which it's flourished has been a period in which the dominant um, forces or power within the church saw the task as an apologetic task. Um, there was a need to argue, to make a case. In Catholicism, 
you have another stream, but it's a stream that was off to the side. You know, maybe if you're living in a village, it wouldn't be off to the side because the monastery was up the hill. And, you know, one of your sons or daughters might actually be there. And you may actually go and visit them at some point. But within, within the, the Western church, the, what, what I guess I would call the mystical tradition, or the tradition about the meaning of the faith as a revelation about human experience, and as a, an invitation to drink deeply of life, as a, a way of helping people understand what gets in the way of life and prevents them from drinking deeply of life. In the Latin tradition, that became, well, it's not fair to say it was separate from the church but it was certainly not a central voice within, within the church. It's there, but you have to look for it. And you have to be somewhat fortunate to find it. And because, because the Latin tradition is so, cate so um, apologetic and then catechetical, <clears throat> It begins, you know, it begins before Aquinas, but that's a kind of amazing manifestation of this. And then we get the Reformation, which did just adds insult to injury, you know, and there's a desperate need to be apologetic, to make argument in the face of, of uh, the falling apart of the empire and, and, and the falling apart of the coherence of the church. So that just exacerbates it. And then, of course, Protestantism picks it up. And you end up with neo-scholastic forms of Lutheranism and Calvinism as well. I only mention this because it's so different from what happened in the East. The East never did this. It's not that there wasn't, you know, in the, in the first few centuries of the church there was struggles about there was struggles about who is Jesus Christ and why do we say he's the fullest expression of the human being the fullest expression of God that we can know but in the east because the apologetic spirit was not and maybe that's just the difference between being Latin and Greek you can tell me more about that. Or maybe it's a result of having the same language, which is the language of the gospel. Maybe it's the coherence of a Greek tradition so that you can deal with Aristotle much better than, than once you translate him through Arabic and delivered to you by Muslims in the West which is also curious, I mean, as to the, the impulse that's there as well. But in the East, this concern for the mysterium, for the mystery, seeing it as a part of our life, it's about the unfolding, the everyday, it's about the encounter, that remained kind of central to the church. So in the Eastern Christian church, the liturgy, the liturgical life is the, the great common discipline. And the thinking about it isn't apologetic. It's not first and foremost trying to make an argument. You know, we see that in Maximus. He's trying to unfold something, trying to invite us to look at at the way in which both scripture as well as the, the fathers and mothers of the church 
what are they, what light are they shedding on, on what's getting in our way, on what's deceiving us in a way that we are no longer able to be joyous in our daily life. So one of the ways this was understood in the East was to see that the leadership of the church, the episcopacy, always had to come from monasteries. The point being, their understanding was that a deep liturgical life with a regard for asceticism, for the disciplines of struggle, that was essential to have that at the center of the church. And my sense is that within the Latin tradition, again, it's not that that's not there, but it's not central. The bishops became princes. The, uh, God knows there are plenty of bishops in the East that thought they were princes too. But the apologetic preoccupation became so central in the West and is down to our own day. So I don't know that this was, you know, this was not done perfectly, obviously, in the Eastern Church either. And there are wonderful, fruitful things in the, in, in the Western church. So I don't mean to pit them against each other, but only, only to highlight a different accent. But I think it's pretty prominent. So it really leads to a very different disposition. And I think we see it, we see that disposition so beautifully in, uh, in Maximus. I've got a dog here with my cat, so. Uh, it's a dogmatic dog, by the way. <clears throat> so uh, that's, that simply sets, sets the stage. So your question was, you want to shape it again? Yeah, I'd asked, what does it mean to then speak from within a tradition? And what does that speech intend or tend towards? What is it trying to do? I think your use of the word mysterium and uh, the, the preoccupation more with mysterium than apologetics, if I could reduce it to yeah. Just that mm -hmm. the answers my question, certainly. And, and also reflects on something that uh, I feel in Maximus constantly, which is that the mystery is constantly open-ended and um, demands response, demands constant response, never taken for granted. And so, yeah. And it's never reduced to something. It was a it was a lovely um, I mean lovely way that you characterized a proposition in um, you know sort of untoward terms, and the alternative expressions like technical expressions that philosophers could use would be something like statement or claim. We don't want to get hung up on terms. The importance is that it's a conception of truth, but even worse than a proposition construed as a transactional way of expressing truth would be the notion of truth as a claim, something you, when you make a claim, there's something definitive about it. Or if it's a premise, it functions in a kind of logically transactional sense in a relation to other propositions that are called um, also premises or conclusions. Um, perhaps, uh, a view is a better way of expressing certain kinds of truths that are open, more open-ended. Proposition, I, I suppose, could be regarded as um, a proposal, 
but not a proposal in a transactional sense, but a proposal that one is um, making that one has no expectation of satisfying in some way. In any case, I one thing we should want to preserve is the notion of truth. But then wean people off of the idea that when they're saying the creed, that the truths they're expressing are ones that they can immodestly contain. But at the same time, we want to have people um, feel assured of something rather than nothing. So truth is indispensable and how it's expressions of truth are in a dispensable if there's a, going to be um, a kind of dance between the cataphatic and the apophatic. I think that's sort of what I was um, kind of heretical thought. It's a, a, an idea of containing a reductive transactional way of construing the truth and relating the truth to that which is intrinsically um, good. And what is intrinsically good is always uh, beyond us. It's a, it's a hard, it's a hard thought to um, grapple with and Maximus is grappling with this thought that there is, um, we, we have a notion of reality, which is another way, you know, saying that we have a notion of truth. And yet the reality that we try to um, express as reality is always um, done so inadequately. It's just, uh, well, I'm not sure that this is a response to that, but but it is a couple thoughts I have. One is that, you know, the the great ecumenical councils weren't about God. They weren't trying to sort out who God was. They were all all of them were in some way, and this includes the discussions about the Trinity. They all, in some way, were a way of wrestling with the question, who do you say that I am? The question that is asked, that Jesus asks, and in, in a variety of places. And those councils were, so in, in this sense, the, the Christian East and the early Christian tradition is its, its Christology is its anthropology. These can't be separated from each other any more than they can in the life in the life of Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. They're deeply bound to each other. That is, they are the Christian way of trying to figure out what it means to be human. The second thing is, and I, I've said this for years, and I think I may be too bold in saying it, but I'll say it again. There isn't really a theology of God in the Eastern Christian Church, just like there isn't in Judaism. Judaism doesn't have a theology of God either. But, you know, in the apologetic tradition of the West, <laughs> it's three volumes, <laughs> you know, and it's enormous number of arguments about it. Um, But I, I think that the real key here, and we've wandered a long way from the text here, but I think the real key here is that in truth isn't a proposition, it's a person. As a proposition, it's a simulacrum. And it's not that simulacrums aren't maybe useful. Maybe they are in certain circumstances. So I don't want to make that point, but only to, to point to what is, is so significant in, in uh, at least in my, my sense, so significant in the way in which 
the tradition that Maximus stands in and in some ways is such a amazing uh, way of holding it all together. It is, the truth is a person. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. It is saying that whatever that means abstractly, whatever it means propositionally, is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is what it means to be human as the image and likeness of God and how that was revealed to us and restored to us in a person that walked the streets of Jerusalem the Valley of the Galilee that um, experienced all that we experience. That was in his nature as you and I are. Fully as you and I are. That's the truth. The truth is you are the image of God. So our propositions, or I like, I like um, W.H. Auden's uh, idea of the secondary world, the secondary world of our philosophical thinking about it. It's not that that's unimportant, but we have to remember what's at the heart here. And I think at the heart here is is a revelation about the truth of being a human being, which says that you're a mystery, just like God. That doesn't mean you don't exist. It means that you're becoming, you're unfolding, that you're coming to be in each encounter, in each moment of communion. And it is saying that Jesus Christ is teacher and model of this. And what he models is how one can be fully that in life. Unblemished and untainted. One can be completely present, even to one's own dying. Yeah. That's not uh, in, inimical to anything I was saying. It's actually sort of consonant. I was trying to, in a very modest way, yeah. say that we, um, we nonetheless say things about God, about person, and an acknowledgement that whatever we say, it certainly could be um, misguided, grotesquely uh, projected, false, and so on. So. But whatever it is, it will be an expression of the truth. Interestingly enough, some philosophers like Quine would dispense with the very idea of a proposition because they see it as part of this platonic heritage that throws um, truth up into the metaphysical you know, realm of the forms. And that what we should talk about is the our symbols, I mean, like S and P and et cetera, and declarative, statements or mathematical formula formulas and um to me i i'm reluctant to give up the idea of truth as a proposition i'm very happy to um take davidson a little bit more seriously and takes himself in saying that all of our propositions are ultimately um metaphors for getting at something that is beyond um, declarative sentences in a way, it, unless you understand declarative sentences as leading into an endless number of uh, interpretations to get back to what we were saying earlier about Maximus, you know, trying different interpretations. So I, I think we're, we're probably coming at a similar, um, excuse the irony, proposition <laughs> from radically different viewpoints. And I think as long as we understand that the, the truth or the proposition, these are just synonymous terms, is ultimately beyond, ever beyond, is um, 
you know, we, we can probably sort of find our way to a similar light that of course is, um, what it was that wonderful expression that Maximus had a hard time. It was one of the most difficult hermeneutic tasks he had when he was trying to make sense of um, Gregory and he uses the, the ever giving effusion mm -hmm. of um, the deity. And that to me is a way of encapsulating the Trinity. It's not something that is out there and it has to, there's a necessity. That was a word that Andrew um, properly hesitated over when he was reading that Gregory's short, um, short excerpt from Gregory. There's a necessity in the Trinity that there is this ever giving effusion. And I suppose that's what uh, our conception of truth should be. It's, you know, flipping that around. It's something that's ever giving, it's effusive. We, we can't possibly contain it. Of course, can't possibly contain each other where if we're so yeah. apt that we shouldn't use the analogy of persons and, and truth in some sense. Anyways, I'm, 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 you know, creating a, probably as much muddiness as clarity in uh, going on in this vein. I just want to say that this is, Michael, I share your, I, I hear a note of, not frustration, but a note of struggle. And I share it completely with you. And I, sometimes at the end of our sessions here, I'm, I've told Andrew, I'm exhausted because what's opened up is a, is a, is a space where it's a struggle and it's deeper and it's harder, but it's also richer. And in that sense, it's also musical. It, it expands, even the struggles expand, even, even those things expand. And so everything's enriched, but I do share that, that note of struggle. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess the, the, the title of this collection of Aphorisms is really a, it's a collection of difficulties and struggles. <laughs> Go, you know, that, that, that's what I think makes um, our conversations interesting is that we are um, struggling. We're not simply, uh, you know, pontificating or, and Maximus is struggling. His ex exegetical work isn't simply explicatory. It's, um, it's representing his struggles. I think as Andrew said, is this is not a straightforward song, at least in my engagement with you guys, this is not a straightforward song. The harmony is deferred at one point, it doesn't resolve at this point, and you wait and someone says something four weeks later, and you think, ah, there's the chord, there's the chord. And and in that sense, it's it's just, it's enriching that we are in a rhythm. It's the rhythm of this thing that that's enriching ultimately, as opposed to uh, to use the the word uh, as opposed to propositional claims or or truths or it's it's the rhythm that's being established and and uh, to me that's the most precious thing about this seminar is is the is this ongoing rhythm and these themes that are like yeah like music they come back and they start to harmonize and they start to thicken and they start to take form and so but it's uh it's not easy to 
to listen and to be in the choir sometimes. But it's, I think it's once one takes on this responsibility, at least I see it as a responsibility to sit here, even to sit here, and, like it's a privilege and a responsibility to just sit here and listen and, and be here and to be present, which means to struggle in silence very often, <laughs> very often. But to, to be confident that that struggle in silence will not necessarily bear fruit, but is partaking of a rhythm that grows and deepens. And maybe that's all there is, a deepening, enriched rhythm, no certainty, just, yeah, just a deeper rhythm. That's beautifully put, my friend. A musical note is a nice one to conclude on, too. Let's pause. <laughs>